we are about to go under the hood. Um, and we have three great panelists who, uh, in one case, is extraordinarily deep experience in a single federal agency. Uh, in, in another case, pretty deep experience. And Jackson's been there two months and a day. Uh, but uh, but in, in all seriousness, uh, you know, you went, you heard the litany of, of federal programs during Alan's presentation, a number of the sidebar conversations have been talking about digging into uh, new or increased uh, appropriations for specific federal programs that can be used in partnership between units of government and NGOs like land trusts. And we're gonna unpack a number of those in this session. So uh, candidly, I do not know the order of presentation, but since I see the slide, I'm gonna take a wild guess that Kari Cohn, who um, is now a small business owner, but previously uh, was part of the senior staff at the Natural Resources Conservation Service, which if you're as old as I am, I remember their name as the soil, no, I don't, I'm not that old, uh, but uh, was deeply engaged in both the conservation investment, excuse me, conservation innovation grants and the regional conservation program partnership grants. And uh, I have to admit, Kari is a personal friend. I don't know if that's a strike against me or for me, but um, nice to see you all again. Uh, my name is Kari Cohen. I mentioned earlier, I uh, just a month ago left uh, my job at NRCS um, and fulfilled my destiny. I live in Washington, D.C. Uh, I fulfilled my destiny of being a D.C. consultant. Um, so uh, while at NRCS, I was there for almost 21 years, started in 2002, right after the 2002 Farm Bill passed. I had nine different jobs. And uh, the last four and a half years, I spent managing a team of folks that managed uh, at the national level, all of NRCS's partner-based programs. Um, chiefly, that was the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, which I'll spend most of my time on today, but also conservation innovation grants, which is very important to the conservation finance community as I'll talk about a little bit also, but we also managed a couple smaller grant programs. Anyway, uh, it was a long time there and it was time to do something different. So I started my own business to help people engage with USDA and NRCS. And because I've been a part of this conservation finance community uh, for some time now, um, Lee and Peter uh, were kind enough to invite me back here. As I said, I was an, uh, I'm an alumnus of this boot camp. I did it down at Duke University a bunch of years ago. So it's great to be back with you all. Um, I'm going to talk about those two big programs that uh, partners like yourselves can avail themselves of, and now uh, is a better time than ever in the history of these programs to do so, and then maybe I'll just close with some other opportunities. Um, raise your hand if you or uh, your entity is a partner in the, an RCPP project. Okay, a few. Uh, don't throw any stones at me, uh, because I know it can be somewhat challenging. Um, I think things are getting better and hopefully they will get even better here soon. But I'm going to talk about this program. Not everybody is so familiar with it. Um, Quick 101, it is administered by NRCS. Uh, it was first authorized in the 2014 Farm Bill and I came to the program right after, actually right before the 2018 Farm Bill passed. So I was basically through the whole 2018 Farm Bill cycle. It was a $300 million a year program, uh, but of course, last summer, it got an additional $5 billion um, in the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which, as I was telling Jackson earlier, can be both a blessing and a curse, especially uh, given the time frame that the money is coming to the agency um, in, which is basically four years. Um, very challenging for a federal agency to swallow and to change years and spend that kind of money when they're used to spending a much smaller amount of money. But um, here's a quick outline of what that, how that money is supposed to be dispersed. The Farm Bill, you know, the, the, the Inflation Reduction Act did something interesting, actually expanded or extended the authorization of RCPP through 2031. So if the Farm Bill were to go away and not be reauthorized even and just expire, uh, that 300 million would still continue through the Inflation Reduction Act each year. But you can see the IRA money goes up very, very quickly. It starts this year small. There's $500 million available right now until August 18th uh, for proposals. 
but then you could see come October 1st, um, if nothing, if the farm bill doesn't pass and change the, you know, how the money is scheduled to roll out, there's going to be over a billion dollars available uh, October 1 to the agency. So no better time for folks to apply. Um, for lots of reasons, the demand for RCPP hasn't been uh, quite that robust. Um, and so I think folks uh, that want money are going to get it. Like, I don't think getting the money is the challenge, um, really. <laughs> yes, I think the challenge for the agency and for the partners is how do we expend the money effectively and better than we have um, and, you know, make sure that by 2031, as much of this uh, five billion plus with the farm bill money is expended um, and before it expires. Um, real fast for RCPP, the beauty of RCPP and also, again, the curse is that you can do anything, partners that are, you know, the diverse as diverse as land trusts and irrigation districts um, can avail themselves of this money to do all sorts of things, whether you're putting cover crops on the ground with producers, uh, actually doing land rental activities, which is this is the only place NRCS has the authority to do land rental conservation easements we've talked a lot about already. And then even these public works, like if you want to do uh, community uh, water supply or flood reduction efforts, you can do all those things. I won't mention too much about this funding split, but it is important for understanding the history of the program. The reason why RCPP exists is because there used to be all these quote unquote earmarks in the farm bill for the Chesapeake Bay and for the Great Lakes. And it got really annoying to the people that ran, you know, were writing the farm bill. So they put all those things into this one program. And so half the money has to be spent on these critical conservation areas like the Chesapeake Bay, uh, like the Great Lakes and uh, the, the Great Plains in the middle, there's this prairie grasslands one, so on and so forth. Um, so that's an important thing to understand about our CPP. And another important thing is that there's three ways to engage with the program. There's what we call the classic, which is for partners that want to influence where NRCS spends its money and on what. Like we want to work on soil health in Northeast Iowa. That's great. But we want NRCS to do it. We want NRCS to go out and do the contracts with landowners um, or, you know, facilitate the easements or what have you. Um, then there's alternative uh, funding arrangements, which is where the partners can say, we have this conservation idea and we want to do it all ourselves. We want to work with the producers or the landowners, uh, and we have the capability and capacity to do that. Um, and that is a great thing for partners. Just have to keep in mind that RCPP has some constraints, some strings around it. It's really meant for partners that can implement conservation in the way that NRCS does, even if the partners are leading that effort. So that's really important to understand. Renewals, I won't talk a lot about, but folks that already have RCPP awards can actually apply for a renewal of that award. I'll mention this quickly because of this audience. This is really the only place, at least to my knowledge, that you're going to see conservation finance language in the Farm Bill. It's actually written into the RCPP statute, thanks to Peter and lots of his uh, friends uh, up leading up to the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, so it actually talks about RCPP being used to leverage private financial mechanisms and performance-based projects. And there are some of that. Um, here's one quick example. There's a soil and water outcomes fund project that started as an RCPP and they just got $90 million or something like that through the Climate Smart Commodities Initiative. But anyway, it's a pay for performance approach where they're taking all these different payers for environmental goods and services. Folks like the state of Iowa, Cargill's paying for the greenhouse gas credits. Pepsi, I think, is paying for some water quality stuff. Um, anyway, like <clears throat> it's a really cool conservation finance concept where they're bringing financial muscle from all these different quarters <clears throat> put, to put you know conservation on the ground with agricultural producers. And there's a few other examples like that taking advantage of that conservation finance language. I'll quickly talk about conservation innovation grants. This one's been around since 2002, basically as long as I was at NRCS. Um, it was expanded in the uh, 2018 Farm Bill to include this new component called on-farm trials. Much smaller program, uh, up to $65 million annually. And the funding priorities change each year. So some years there's a, you know, availability of a conservation finance thing or conservation finance like thing. And this is where um, 
over uh, since 2015, we were able to do something like 40 to 45 projects. And I think, yeah, I'll just mention this because my time is limited here, but we funded over 40 projects that were funding some sort of conservation finance concept, including this thing called the Conservation Finance Roundtable that the Conservation Finance Network was putting on and continues to put on, um, which was really cool. Um, there was this lessons learned uh, report that I think I sent to Julia's to make a, a something that everyone here could have access to. Um, Gordian Knot strategies, along with Conservation Finance Network, got a little bit of money to be able to do this analysis of this cohort of conservation finance projects. And there was some really cool stuff that came out of that. So if you're interested, I encourage you to take a look. And again, folks that have conservation finance concepts, every once in a while, when CIG rolls around to the priority, there might be something available for you there. But I glossed over this. The reason we were able to do that in CIG is because there's this little bit of language in the statute, again, going back to the Farm Bill, where it talks about market systems for pollution reduction. And we kind of use that as an inroad to be able to do this conservation finance stuff at NRCS, um, which was really cool and exciting. I think that's largely it. I'll just mention there's other opportunities at NRCS uh, and USDA writ large. If you're interested in urban agriculture, uh, there's urban ag grants that have been growing, uh, the dollars available. Uh, Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities, I mentioned that. This was the big $3 billion initiative that rolled out last year. Unclear if that's gonna come back again. There's rumors in both directions but certainly an amazing opportunity for organizations to get a whole lot of money to do good climate related things on the ground. It's not available. The funding wasn't able to be used for easements, which kind of cut that community out. Um, and I keep telling the easements community, hey, look at RCPP because there's gonna be sort of similar money there, um, maybe with some different strings attached. Uh, but anyway, hopefully the easement community will find their way to uh, really put in some big proposals for RCPP moving forward. So recognizing that I think that's the end of my time, I'll just stop there. Happy to talk to any of you today or certainly during the Q&A about these and any other USDA opportunities. Jackson. Hey guys. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Good. Um, I'm Jackson Moeller. I'm with the Conserva uh, Conservation Finance Network. Wow. Uh, that's how new I am to the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, I've been there for about two months. Um, and so if you think of it like an airplane, I know how to work like two or three switches of that huge uh, board. And so uh, in the last week, we've had three more teammates uh, of mine join from the U.S. Forest Service, other departments. And so I'm feeling like I have uh, co-pilots now to help me figure out uh, some of those switches and get the money out the door. Um, so I came from the Conservation Finance Network. I was director of partnerships for them. And before that, I was a deal guy for the Nature Conservancy in Colorado and in the Great Plains. So uh, layering in lots of different revenue streams uh, and doing large land deals. Uh, so my role with the Forest Service is kind of like my role at CFN and TNC, being a deal doctor for uh, state programs, uh, the State Forest Service and other uh, partners of Forest Legacy, as well as uh, partners, land trust partners on how to um, put together deals, how to keep deals on the rails, how to find match. Uh, they brought me in really to um, build the pipeline of projects for all, all this money that's coming in. Um, and then also I'll talk about later if I get to that uh, part of the presentation, uh, we've got 450 million for emerging markets and participation in emerging markets. And so that's a large part of my role. So just to raise the hands, how many people have used Forest Legacy uh, in, I see Peter Stein. Okay, <laughs> a few others, great. Uh, forest Legacy basically uh, is keeping forests as forests. Um, a private landowner will sell a real estate interest, whether that's fee simple, or a conservation easement to a state agency or other government agency. Um, and uh, I think Alan Front was saying, uh, it's been 1990 Farm Bill was when that got created. And so in 33 years, we just last week or in the last two weeks, conserved our 3 million uh, acre milestone. So uh, a lot of you heavy users here 
thank you for your participation in that milestone. Um, let me see here. Uh, so, uh, and Alan mentioned yesterday, the growth of the program, kind of like Kari's uh, presentation here, three years ago with LWCF permanent funding, uh, had a big influx of money from 64 million to 78 million. Um, and then I sound like a tech bro, but 10X, $700 million came in from Myra funding uh, also for Forest Legacy. So uh, regular, a regular Forest Legacy, or as Kari would say, classic Forest Legacy uh, is through the president's budget and the appropriations process. And so people will, uh, uh, states will submit their proposals. You have $20 million for one to three projects. Uh, which averages out to about $7 million a project. Uh, and that uh, the Forest Service will make a prioritized list um, and then send that to Congress to approve. And so this process takes some time. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna compare that against the new uh, uh, Hulk IRA Forest Legacy, which is already appropriated by Congress. So this is gonna be uh, faster money out the door. I'm not going to say it's fast money out the door, but faster money. Uh, we just released the NOFO, the Notice of Funding Opportunity, I think last month. And then this month in June, we're going to release the RFP for this new IRA Forest Legacy money. And so there's three categories. Uh, there's large landscapes, uh, which is up to $50 million per project, uh, one from each state. And that's you know once in a lifetime opportunities. The next budget, uh, the next bucket is the small tracks, and this is up to 1.5 million dollars, uh, and that is for adjacent or an inholding of already conserved properties. So not sprinkled out willy nilly, but adjacent or withholding uh, inholding within uh, already conserved uh, lands. And then the last bucket. Uh, similar to the first, up to 50 million per project for state tribe partnerships. Um, this next group of uh, funding is, thank you, this is great, uh, is uh, grants that help get the money out the door for this new uh, funding opportunities and increase efficiencies. And I'm just gonna call out a couple here. Uh, the second and third buckets, Trust for Public Land and First Nations Development Institute, helping states and partners with outreach, uh, tribal outreach. Uh, there's one down near the bottom, Conservation Finance Network with coaching and technical assistance to states on how to blend different uh, funding streams and tools uh, into their work. And then one not on the list, uh, Liz presented yesterday uh, and it was mentioned in the panel earlier today, uh, City Forest Credits and Western Reserve Land Conservancy, we're supporting them uh, not for general webinars on what is a carbon credit or what is an urban carbon credit, but like CFN, technical assistance and coaching on how do you put together one of these deals? How do you earn a credit? How do you sell a credit? Um, and so trying to get more projects on the ground. So this next and, and almost last slide is this new $450 million for um, new authorities of ours. And so uh, the first bucket here is 150 million for underserved landowners for cost share payments uh, for climate uh, mitigation and forest resilient practices like fuels reduction or reforestation, uh, that type of work. The next bucket is also for underserved landowners and uh, uh, trying to support their participation in environmental markets. And that's come up uh, yesterday with the carbon panel as well as uh, earlier today on how do we uh, have more equitable access to these markets. Uh, third bucket is smaller acreage that's under 2,500 acres. That might be a large project in Manhattan, but a small project in Montana, but that's the, the guidelines we're working with. And the last one is um, practice payments for non-federal landowners. And I'm just gonna do a quick example or things we're thinking about for those. Uh, the first one with the cost share payments, uh, a lot of states, I think 30 or 40, already have existing cost share programs. And I think the low hanging fruit, at least for us in the first year, is expanding those programs to focus on underserved landowners. They have the infrastructure. And so uh, getting that expansion seems like a good start. And then also not just 
uh, uh, developing those programs, but also sharing insight and learnings, creating a playbook for those states that don't have cost share programs so that they're not recreating the wheel. And then uh, those other two buckets with the, thank you, the underserved landowners and environmental markets and small acreage uh, outreach for those types of landowners is really high on our list. We've already given uh, $100,000 a year to state programs to develop a plan for their outreach and also have consulting expertise from Native Americans in philanthropy and, and other groups like that, uh, like First Nations. Um, so understanding the barriers to accessing these markets and then how do we soften or eliminate those barriers. And then one final thing I'll say is there's different phases of the market. And so funders like Forest Service really like those pilots and getting on the ground. And I'm doing my best to uh, also have room for that early market phase and pre-market phase in order to get those pilots. We've, we've expanding a program 10X. And so I think there's a lot of room there for uh, our investment. And so uh, I'm here all day, but there's my email for those folks uh, on the phone. Uh, and my job is to help you and partners get money out of the door from Forest Service. So I, I, my door is open and I welcome your emails and calls. Hi, good morning, everyone. Almost afternoon. My name's Erica Rohr. I'm with the Department of Defense's REPI program. I am the DOD Noise Program Director. We'll get a little bit more into why I'm here, but mainly uh, for today, my coworkers are off celebrating one of our accomplishments. They're uh, one of our Sentinel Landscape uh, accomplishments, and I'm here in their place today. So along those lines, I'm going to hold on to notes so I don't uh, mess up what they're doing and explain to you. So, okay, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the REPI program. I think you've heard a little bit about it yesterday. Um, talk a little bit about why it's established, um, why partnerships are so critical to the DoD mission, and then focus a little bit on uh, how the REPI program participates in Sentinel landscapes and what's um, on the horizon for our work. Did I hit the right button? Am I not hearing that? I'm hitting that. Yeah. Oh, I broke it on you. Sorry. No problem. Look at the. Uh -oh. oh, we're asleep. Do you have any slides? No, I'll just. <laughs> there <we> go. <laughs> yeah. All righty. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, we talked last night during dinner, um, you know, what is the mission of your partners and understanding that when you're looking for finances. So this slide kind of talks a little bit about why we're in this space. So for background, DOD owns and manages um, 28 million acres. And the big key here too is we manage over 450 species that are listed as either threatened or endangered under the Endangered Species Act and hundreds more are at risk and are um, also found on our lands. Um, we have a requirement to use this land though, right? We're not um, Fish and Wildlife Service. This is our job is to train our volunteer men and women in uniform um, and to give them that we have this land that we need in our airspace to ensure that they get the best possible training and preparation to do their jobs. Um, this means that we need realistic and varied environments to ensure we have space, safe spaces for training new systems like aircraft and vehicles. Um, however, when we do train, we do create a lot of dust, smoke, and we also make noise, not always things you want um, as your neighbor and things that they like. Um, but there are things that we do do too. We also need dark skies um, and we also need buffers around our training and operations to ensure the safety of our neighbor, neighbors and those people we are training. Um, unfortunately, our installations are no longer um, in isolated areas like most of them were created. Therefore, we need to partner um, with our neighbors. That includes federal agencies, state and local folks, as well as private organizations to promote compatible lands and um, economic drivers such as farming, ranching, and forests. Um, we want to impress protect those important habitats at the landscape level. Uh, again, we don't want to be the last home for a lot of these species. Um, and we want to also enhance military installation readiness and resilience from the uh, ever-changing climate that we've been talking about, like extreme storms and wildfires. And lastly, we are also part of that community. 
So we want to ensure um, high quality of life also for us as we are also part of, we are everyone's neighbors as well. Okay, so this slide is kind of talking about the program components of RUPI. Um, it's a partnership program with multiple authorities that allow us to do conservation and climate resilience work. There's three primary components of the RUPI program, um, stakeholder engagement, landscape partnerships, and projects. Projects can include working with partners on traditional conservation easements to prevent development or preserve habitats. It also includes doing uh, land management activities. The next slide I'll talk, I'll show you where the REPI projects are occurring, but um, just realize looking at that from the lower to high end, 90% of our program funding goes to projects that's on the ground implementation um, and it's uh, facilitated by the other two components. So um, working in close collaboration with multiple federal agencies, non-government organizations, regional partnerships um, is supports the development of those projects and identifying those opportunities. Um, and the landscape partnerships um, you see here are ways for us to focus some of that stakeholder engagement on specific regions or specific landscapes for targeted efforts. Okay, so this slide here um, highlights the 120 REPI projects across the 35 states and territories um, to give you a sense of where we work. Um, it's important to emphasize that the REPI program only works with willing landowners on a voluntary basis. Um, we receive funding from Congress each year, as well as support from the military services own personal funding and partner contributions. Um, we have successfully protected uh, over 1.18 million acres through FY22. And this would not be possible without our partner support. Um, we have received over 1.13 billion and partner funding to be exact. So as I mentioned, I am the DOD Operational Noise Program Director. Um, so we work to reduce the adverse effects of military training noise on our communities. Um, mitigating uh, noise proximate to installations is by far the most cited justification used by installations and communities for um, why they're pursuing REPI projects. Um, by conserving natural areas and working with our communities to provide those buffers we talked about. Um, and this, that last bullet there kind of talks to you a little bit about some of the other programs that DOD has to encourage compatible land use activities related to noise concerns. Uh, okay, so the Sentinel Landscapes, this is where our director and most of the team is at today is celebrating this act of this. Um, so Sentinel Landscape Partnership expands how DOD works with our partners. It seeks to align the goals and benefits of our program with other federal agency. Um, the partnership is a coalition of federal agencies, state and local governments, and non-governmental organizations that work to advance common landscape objectives. It was founded in 2013 by the Department of Agriculture, Department of Interior, and DOD, um, with the overarching goals of strengthening military readiness, bolstering agriculture and forestry productivity, conserving natural resources, um, access to recreation. This slide displays the 11 that we currently have um, designated. Okay, uh, in FWAY, Fiscal Year 19 National Defense Authorization Act um, formally recognized Sentinel Landscape Partnership. This chart kind of gives you an idea of the um, different partnerships that are engaged here. The, high, the key here is that the MOU that was formed between the three founding agencies makes it permanent that REPI funds, so it's kind of interesting, is the um, serves as a non-federal match for federal grants. So usually it's hard to find those. So DOD funds can now serve as a non-federal match for basically anything. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Okay. Key, key point here is that we, DOD funds can now serve as a non-federal match in these programs. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna save us a little bit of time because we, um, as part of this, we, um, uh, I came today to talk about a case study, but turns out that you guys all heard about it yesterday. So uh, I'm gonna not really talk about it, but just recognize obviously there's a great opportunities and partnerships there through the Sentinel landscape. This is uh, showcasing the Fort Huachuca one, I'm talking about the water conservation project. Uh, I, I would highlight that 
A lot of times DOD likes to kind of be more of a silent partner. We don't always like to toot our own horn of what we're doing. Um, if you want to learn about another Sentinel landscape project, there um, on Disney Plus, there is the Path of the Panther, which is also highlighting in Florida our efforts to conserve properties out there. Um, DOD was a major funding partner, but I don't think we're even, we barely are mentioned or talked about in it. So that's typical of us. <laughs> so, um, oops, wrong way. Okay, so what's next? Um, the What we're at next is in ninth, in 2019, Congress expanded our authority to address climate resilience. Um, talking, we are now able to put some of our money towards protection, restoration, and enhancement um, off base. So that shows you some of the ideas of some of the things that we've been able to fund. Um, we are also putting a concerted effort of taking some of those funds and putting them towards specific um, projects. And one of them is highlighted here is the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation's National Coastal Resilience Fund. Um, so definitely thinking outside the box here, lots of amazing opportunities at a landscape level. Um, the next one is um, it, we're increasing funding and capacity. So one of the ones that is highlighted here is the American America the Beautiful Challenge. Uh, the idea here is it's one of the first large scale efforts by the federal government um, to ease access to funding. We have contributed to this project or to this fund specifically tied to Sentinel landscapes and supporting installation resiliency. And again, key here is that DOD funds can be a, a non-federal partner match. Um, and lastly is a plug. Um, we are hosting, it's coming up soon, July 10th through 13th in St. Louis. We are um, having a focus workshop on climate resilience. This is open to everybody. It's free, it's not just DOD. And um, we would love to have you here, love to have you part of that conversation. I think there are some folks from this workshop and bootcamp that are gonna be in attendance. So um, please come, again, it's free. And, and that's it. I'm gonna put, and this is if you'd like to learn more about REPI. Hopefully you guys have these slides and there's a lot of QR codes to pick, take pictures of quickly. <laughs> so that's it. Do you have any questions? Yes. Well, hang on till the mic gets to you. Yes, this is from one of our virtual attendees. Uh, question for the presenter. Which of the program's DOD grants can be served as non-federal match funds? There are actually a variety of them. Uh, the biggest thing I would say to do is, I'm not sure I see it on there, but we actually have, if you go on to the uh, REPI website, there is a recent um, guide that we just put out on resiliency. And that um, guide highlights all of the funding opportunities. And there's too many to honestly list right now. I can think of the BRIC program. We talked about the National Fish and Wildlife Service program. There's almost anything in the Sentinel. So it, it really is, there's a, a lot out there. So that guide is probably the best resource for you. Right before lunch. Other questions? Okay, right here. Thank you very much. Okay, this is RCPP question, so forgive me. Um, maybe you could tell us some um, interesting or innovative ways that land rental contracts have been used under RCPP? Uh, land rental, that's a great question. I think when uh, the land rental authority was uh, added to RCPP in the 2018 Farm Bill, and I think uh, the agency leadership at the time were a little bit uh, hesitant because they didn't want to turn RCPP into another conservation reserve program, which is the big land rental program at USDA. It's actually managed by our sister agency. Um, so what we did at the time was said, hey, if folks have interesting short-term rental ideas, um, for example, organic transitions, a pretty good example, but there's other things that people have submitted proposals uh, to like let the, in the Klamath Basin, there was kind of a fallow period concept that they had developed. We didn't see a lot of action in the land rental space um, because we had sort of warned people off these sort of long-term land rental ideas. Hmm. I will, I've told other people this, 90% of the proposals that come in 
90% of the money that are included in those proposals are in two things, entity held easements and land management. And um, the agency spend a lot of energy developing policy for all of these different activities, including U.S. held easements, rentals, um, and the watershed uh, project or public works piece. Something for the Farm Bill folks to think about, I think, is, you know, is that a good use of the agency's time? Because it takes a long time to develop policy, as the easements community knows. It took like three years or more to develop all the policy around RCPP easements after the 2018 Farm Bill. Is U.S. held easement something that we need to spend a lot of time on? If the partners, the partners are speaking to us through these proposals, maybe the program is just a land management and entity held easements thing, and oof, things would happen a lot faster and easier, I think. But it's a good question. The rental thing was just not something that a lot of people used. Um, I don't know if that's going to continue. Question in the back. Yeah, this is another RCPP question. <clears throat> I mean, I work as part of a central landscape, and we're interested, um, you know, in working with NRCS and you know maybe pairing an RCPP with some you know repi funding. But honestly, we're having kind of a struggle engaging with NRCS, and so I'm wondering if you could talk about like what makes them tick because getting them to commit to helping us design an RCPP or go to meetings, like we never talk to the state conservationist, like. Are they graded on how many RCPPs get out? Are they trying not to do it because it's going to be a lot of work? Like, how do I can what what make? Yeah, give me the tips here. <laughs> do you want to sign a contract with me later? We can. Uh, <laughs> no. um, yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, you know, it is a very frustrating thing for partners, um, and I was frustrated myself. Um, oof, how to answer that? So there's 51 state conservationists, 51 states that out there. And partner experience um, varies depending on what state you're in, unfortunately, right? All these projects are managed at the state level. You're not going to get an award unless your state conservationist supports your idea. Like that's pretty, that's not said anywhere, but it's pretty foundational. Um, and some state cons don't give a rip about the program and there are those that really do value the program. And unfortunately, that's just the way it is. Now, I think the agency can do things to mitigate that. Um, because of the way that the pro uh, program is structured right now, it's a national funding announcement. And state cons aren't graded on how many uh, RCPP proposals come in or how many awards are there are in their state. If you look at a program like EQIP or CSP, states get allocations, which mean, hey, uh, Connecticut, you're going to get $10 million. And if the state con doesn't spend all that money, that's a problem for them. So, you know, one of the things we had kicked around in the last year or two before I left was actually giving RCPP allocations to states so that it would be on their books. And if they don't spend it, it is a performance issue. Um, I think that would really turn things around. It doesn't have to be all the money because um, there's good reasons not to do that as well. But I do think giving some allocations to states to make sure, I mean, we had states that we never, you know, in the last three years, we didn't get a single proposal from. You can't tell me there aren't partners that are working in those states and interested in the program. Um, and so I get it. A lot of state cons saw it as soft money, right? They never knew how many awards they were going to get. They didn't feel like they could staff up appropriately because the money was not solid. Um, but for most states, you know, there was enough partner interest, I think, to really um, invest in the program and in the people necessary to run the program. So like you have states like California, Oregon, like Oregon's a good example. The number one RCPP state was Oregon as far as number of awards and number amount of money. There's a single RCPP coordinator in that state. That's just not going to work for 25, they had like 25 active projects. Um, I know that's going to change soon. They're planning on hiring more people, especially with the IRA money coming. Um, so I think it's, the agency needs to change some things with the program to make sure that all the states are invested and staffed appropriately to deal with the partner interest that's going to be coming at them here. Did you want to say something, Peter? Never 
some parts of RCP never being utilized, like U.S. held easements uh, or the rental that we just discussed. Um, the fact that entity held easements are the giant share, does that change the workload uh, at the state level? I mean, I think it does, but. I mean, there's, yeah, we can talk all day about federal easements and the challenges there, which I think the agency is actually taking steps to improve and hopefully we'll do more. Um, but yes, I think, you know, because RCPP is a, such a complex program and you have all these pieces, like an RCPP coordinator who is, you know, might be coming from one walk of NRCS life, they might not be that familiar with easements. And so the easements folks in the state have to get engaged and maybe they're not, they're busy and they don't want to get engaged. And, you know, there's all these complexities with the program that from a staffing standpoint are really challenging. And so, again, I my message the day after the IRA passed to my staff was, okay, whatever we were doing is not that important anymore. We are now like a fire hose and we need to figure out how to turn the hose on and have partners come and bathe in the hose, right? Um, I don't know that the agency is moving fast enough to come to that mindset because again if as i tell everybody if when you have a fire hose some of the water is going to get places where you don't want it to get and that's okay to me if you spend 80 percent of five billion well that's a lot better than not spending it at all um so you know i hope that my my successors will find a way to like uh get to a place where the the partners are coming with proposals because they see that the program's easier to deal with because it's a program that unless the partners are there you don't have a program you're not spending the money um so the agency is going to have to figure it out i just want to say quickly not to monopolize the time the the panel before this was really important it's important for the federal agencies too jackson mentioned the underserved community work that they're doing there's this justice 40 strategy that the administration has which is to spend 40 percent of all federal funding on underserved communities and uh, individuals it's a big problem for a program like rcpp where you rely on what comes in the door and what came in the door very little of it was projects going to those underserved communities and individuals so you know i think that's another big place for the agency to do a lot of work uh, because it's got a justice 40 plan it's got a strategy we're going to spend 40 percent of our cpp funding for example on these folks and these communities as an rcpp guy i didn't have a lot of tools at my disposal to figure out how to do that and how to get more proposals in it's all about the proposals coming in right so just wanted to mention that it's a real struggle and something the agency needs to figure out very quickly hey curry i'm going to Pick up on this. I'm Andre Valley and Metcalf Foundation, and I'm from this little place northwest called Canada. Um, and what you're sharing just feels so familiar from the last three to four years in Canada. We've had some banner years in terms of billions uh, announced and invested in conservation, but there's real challenges. Uh, I mean, lovely people working within the federal bureaucracy in Ottawa uh, with getting the money out the door. Um, there's so many layers they're dealing with. Of course, we've got jurisdictional dynamics with our subnationals. And I'm just curious, you were alluding to it there with some of this money going to states. Like, are there any creative, creative discussions to basically free that money? Like to park it outside of government in some way that allows for more flexibility, allows for different timelines, processes around that, that uh, that amount of funding is just so big and to leave it on the table like we heard from Alan front yesterday is a real risk I'm just curious if you guys that's a great question I, I've been talking a lot like Jackson probably has things he can say on this too so let me ask Jackson um we're we are we I am uh looking into uh awards to uh, for lack of a better word, aggregators like Native Americans in philanthropy or First Nations or Heirs Property Center um, to then sub award and sub grant out. They have the relationships, they have that outreach uh, infrastructure. And so I think there are opportunities. I don't know the the ins and outs. I'm again two months in and the the switchboard, but um I'm committed to figuring it out. 
And I'll just say, you know, RCPP is not really built that way. At least it hasn't been. Um, it's very project based and folks apply and get money. But I do think um, there's interest out there in doing similar things. I think it would be a good way to get at some of this Justice 40 strategy and underserved communities and, and individuals because you need those intermediaries that work with those groups and producers and those might not be folks that uh, are traditionally going to find their way to an RCPP project or proposal. And so, um, again, I'm not at the agency anymore. It was definitely something in, after the Inflation Reduction Act passed. There were lots of ideas about how do we possibly spend this amount of money. And my hope actually is that then in the next farm bill that the money gets kind of spread out more because it really is almost... Um, it's not impossible, but it's impossible under the current uh, way that RCPP is structured, I think, to spend that money and spend it well and have partners have a decent experience. Um, so I think, you know, come October 1, there's going to be a billion dollars, but hopefully the next farm bill will spread it out over a few more years and make it a little bit more palatable. We'll just um, just go a little further for the questions just asked. Erica covered it, but she covered so much that you may not have noticed. Uh, both Interior Agriculture and DOD moved money to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. So I don't know if any of you have followed their, you know, the second round ended a month ago, uh, but there will be more rounds of what's called the America the Beautiful Challenge at National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And that's a I think, unfortunately, it's not $20 billion, it's $400 million, but still, it's a significant amount of money where uh, it's ascension, essentially a recession-proof, meaning Congress can't do anything about that uh, if Congress gets nasty. Uh, and second, uh, notwithstanding a little bit of bureaucracy at the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, it's nothing like uh, one of the agencies that was represented on this panel. <laughs> I think uh, on the complexity issue, I'll just quickly say, uh, uh, yeah, RCPP is meant to, the agency is built it to be this all things to all people. There's all this flexibility. And with flexibility, unfortunately, comes complexity. It's like hard to have a really flexible federal thing that's not sort of complex. But, um, I, you know, I think there's, the agency understands it. They're making, taking steps to um, improve things and make it easier. Uh, but, you know, the big thing for me for these partner driven projects is that the statute right now is written to even if the partners have a great conservation idea and hey, we're going to do this thing, they're still supposed to do it in the way that NRCS does it, which a lot of people, you know, to the lay person, they don't really understand what that means. And that makes it really hard to, to follow NRCS standards and specs. What does that even mean? Uh, to do HEL and wetlands compliance and NEPA, like all this stuff has to be done in the way that NRCS does it. And for us at the agency, it was really easy because it was embedded into our software and there's check boxes and like, hey, this is simple. The agency hasn't built an infrastructure uh, for these partner driven projects. And partially that's because it's so kind of a new concept, but the climate smart commodities folks, those $3 billion that got all that money, they're a little bit, whoa, we got to do some of this stuff too. And I don't know that they all realize that. So um, there's definitely, you know, complexities that the agency's got to figure out. There's some other questions, though. So I was just a little bit curious about, like, the types of partnerships or programs. Um, I work for an agroforestry development company, so we're very much involved in, like, the regen ag movement. A lot of conservation about conserving existing forests. How does sort of RCPP apply to sort of developers looking to say, install like a new sustainable forest or implement regen ag practices like crop rotation, cover crop and things like that? Or uh, oof, you can do all those things, right? You can do agroforestry through RCPP. You can do certainly a lot of land management, quote unquote, regenerative ag stuff is being done through RCPP. Again, it's a lot easier if you do it in the way that NRCS has to do it because that's the way the statute's written. So if you're following NRCS's agroforestry standard, well, hey, that's pretty easy to do that, quote unquote, easy. Um, but again, that's <laughs> not to say that's where I come in, but like the folks that have hired me so far are folks that don't really 
they they know that they want to do private lands agriculture and they know what they want, but they don't really understand how to take their idea and translate it into how NRCS does things. And I think there is a real barrier to entry there. And I, again, this is the place where I think the statute can maybe be modified to allow partners to do things that are good and have conservation benefit, but may, they don't have to necessarily follow the letter of the NRCS law. And that's, I don't know if, if that's something to figure out for the Farm Bill folks, but I mean, otherwise there's a real barrier to entry because you may not know what all those things I just talked about are, and um, that's trouble for sure. Looks like you have something to say about that sort of. Well, I had a follow-up question, which is, I definitely don't know what any of those things are. And I, I, I my question was gonna be, you keep on saying the way NRCS does yeah. things, and I have no idea what that means, but therefore where should I look? Um, and then specifically to a couple of the examples you gave, can you just unpack uh, entity held easement versus US, if I've heard the vocabulary right? Um, like just some, there was a comment on day one that finance jargon is to keep people out. Yeah. And I'm feeling like it's not, you know, I, I get the finance bit, but not the conservation jargon as easily. Yeah. And, and sorry, just one DOD question, which is a similar kind of definitional piece. You said off base. Is there a, is there more around what off base activity means? Um, okay, I'll, I'll go, I guess the easier one first. Um, so traditionally, it's basically like the military property boundary lines is anything off base. So a lot of the times, what that means for us now too, as I kind of mentioned, is also um, airspace. So a lot of critical habitat, um, we're all in the same area, the same landscape. So we're working with where we're uh, connected uh, via ecosystems, not only just like that traditional like donut around a base. So it's, it can be pretty far reaching. Um, we've got some actually really amazing DOD innovators in the room here who are your uh, partners this week. Um, uh, they can definitely pick your brains. Uh, one of them is in the back room. They're smiling and trying to hide right now. Jen Elke Farley, she has really taken that uh, really far with um, how do you preserve like uh, resident killer whales by preserving salmon habitat upstream. So it, we go pretty far in what we need to do to um, help preserve and, and support resiliency. You, I'm sorry, were you asking what a U.S. held easement is versus entity held? Yeah. Yeah, just real fast on that. Uh, NRCS has the two types of easements. That's, sorry, not NRCS, RCPP. Entity held, which a lot of land trusts understand that land trust holds the easement. NRCS pays for some portion of the value of the easement. U.S. held easements are where the federal government is actually holding the easement, um, which we have this, NRCS has this big program called the Wetland Reserve Enhancement, which is all U.S. held easements on for wetlands and agricultural landscapes. Um, but where do you go to find out what all those things I'm talking about? There's a funding announcement out right now. It's out till August 18th. It's available. Um, and in that, you'll see a lot of this stuff in theory explained, um, at least much more in depth than I could go into in the 10 minutes I had. Um, but then that is really the role of the RCPP coordinator out there in each state, right? Each state has an RCPP coordinator. Again, of varying competencies and capacities, but like that is their job is to, when partners are interested in partnering with NRCS on RCPP to help explain the program and how it works. Um, again, they're often understaffed. Um, maybe it's an acting person because the usual RCPP coordinator went to do something else. Um, so it can be quite challenging. And sometimes it takes two years before a partnership is really ready to apply to RCPP, especially if they're coming in brand new and don't understand the ins and outs of the program. So, um, you know, it can take a while, uh, but hopefully you, you know, your RCPP coordinator is really good and, um, you know, will help you navigate the process. Uh, one thing I'd add is that I don't know what the average amount of partners in an RCPP is, but you may not know, but a partner of yours does. And so relying on one another for that kind of, and, and maybe not on an RCS. Sure. I mean, the, the the program is eligible to lots of different types of partners, NGOs, even for-profit companies, irrigation districts, communities, departments of agriculture. There's often folks that do understand um, NRCS, like departments of agriculture or some NGOs. So, um, yeah, often 
the lead partner will be someone that sort of gets it and can bring other folks along. We've just got a couple minutes. Is there one more question or is everybody ready to eat? Okay. I uh, just want to thank everybody and my colleagues up here. Um, hopefully uh, we enlightened you a little bit and um, we'll be around as Jackson said earlier, if folks want to talk some more. <laughs>